It's certainly a pleasure to see each one. I want to welcome everyone that's present this morning. We're thankful that you're here and we're able to uh, worship together. In the lesson of the hour, I'd like to uh, continue with a series of lessons that we began at the first of the year, looking at the seven churches of Asia that are written to and the letters that are written to them in the book of Revelation. Uh, we're trying to be the Church of Christ in Mustang, and we want to be faithful to our Lord, do things that are commendable in His sight, and avoid those things that He would condemn. And here we have seven letters written to seven real churches in the first century, where the Lord uh, tells to each one of them, each one of them, the things that He approves of that they're doing, and the things that uh, that He has against them. And of course, we want to make sure that we're living correctly in the sight of God. The church at Pergamum uh, is the next letter we want to look at in Revelation chapter 2 and verses 12 through 17. It's been called the church or the city where Satan dwells, is what Jesus says in this place. He particularly is exercising rule in that city. His throne is there, and the Christians are under a great deal of uh, pressure to compromise their faith. And so the Lord is encouraging them to stand, uh, stand up for his ways and not give in to those that would uh, teach compromise. In uh, looking at this uh, city, just like with the other uh, letters that we studied to Ephesus and to Smyrna, uh, kind of on the, as these letters are delivered, going in a circle. And the first one was F, the feet uh, to Ephesus and then to Smyrna. And now about 40 miles north of Smyrna in Asia Minor is Pergamum. And you can see on an ancient map there uh, uh, what would be Turkey today on the uh, western side. There's a district at that time was called Asia. We call it Asia Minor because we have a whole continent we call Asia today. But Asia Minor was that province. And you can see Pergamum is the city that was the capital in ancient times over the area of of uh, Asia. Uh, so for many years, over 400 years, Pergamum had been a capital city, an important city in the world history. And uh, it was at the time that this letter was written to the church there. Uh, Sir William Ramsey uh, wrote a book on the seven churches of Asia. He's a famous uh, archaeologist and scholar of um, the Greeks and uh, and wrote a number of excellent books on the on uh, the life of Paul and the churches of Asia. Uh, Ramsey said about the city of Pergamum, he says, beyond all other cities in Asia Minor, it gives the traveler the impression of a royal city, the home, the home of authority. The rocky hill on which it stands is so huge and dominates the broad plain of the Caicos so proudly and so boldly. And there's a picture of that is taken with some labels uh, placed on it that shows that great, you know, the city would be down here below. Uh, this is the Areopagus, the, uh, or the Acropolis, the upper city, and it's built on the top of the huge hill that overshadows the city, and you can see the citadel up there and the Trajan's Temple, a temple to Caesar that's on the hilltop there and the theater that was on the side of the hill, and a great altar to Zeus that looked like a throne setting up there on the mountain. Uh, so a city that's full of, of uh, pagan worship and, uh, uh, you know, uh, royal authority or, or uh, uh, civil authority and uh, full of Greek culture when you look upon that city. It was the capital of the province. It was the residence of the proconsul from Rome that ruled over Asia Minor, or that district uh, in Roman times, the province of Asia. It had been a capital for 400 years before the Romans uh, got in charge. It was a capital for the Seleucids. They were, you know, one-fourth of Alexander the Great's uh, kingdom that he had when he died. It was divided up between four generals, and the Seleucids had charge over this part of what Alexander the Great conquered in 282. Then in 190 B.C., uh, Syria's uh, Antiochus III uh, was defeated, 
and that turned over then to the rule of Attalus, uh, was in charge of the city, and he was able to get their freedom there uh, from the Seleucids with the help of Rome. When he died, he bequeathed his kingdom to the Romans so that the Romans took over the province when he died. So it was part of his will that instead of continuing in his family, the Romans would take over. So it was a very uh, Roman city, a uh, city very loyal to Rome. <laughs> they were the first to set up idols and uh, temples to the spirit of Rome and to uh, Caesar Augustus as a god. And so they worship Caesar in that place. So that's something to know about its background. There are some of the ruins that you could see today if you went to look at this Areopagus. There's the theater on the side of the hill. You can see the, where most of the people would live down below the, the, the upper city there where all the temples were. And it's a city full of uh, this pagan culture. It was a big religious center, the city of Pergamum. Uh, it wasn't a commercial city like Ephesus was or like Smyrna had become, but it was known for uh, the Greek culture and all of this uh, paganism that was there. Uh, one thing that's known about the city of Pergamum is it was the second great city of learning when it came to a library. We always hear about the great library at Alexandria in Egypt. Well, they had a great library that was second to that in number of books and all that was at uh, the city of Pergamum. There's an interesting history. The leader of Pergamum was wanting it to become the great library, and he tried to go down and get the head librarian and the great scholar at the library in Alexandria and bring him up there to work at his library. And when the Ptolemy uh, king that was in charge there heard about what he was trying to do, stealing his scholar, he put the scholar under house arrest and wouldn't let him leave. And... Uh, he would, he, all of the papyrus that they used for paper came from Egypt. And so he wouldn't let them ship out any paper or any papyrus up there to Pergamum anymore for their library. So they were forced by necessity to come up with another form of paper or another form of, of making scrolls. And they came up with parchment. Parchment gets its name from Pergamum or vellum, where they take animal skins and, you know, fix them uh, uh, especially to be able to use them for scrolls and for writing. And eventually, as history unfolds, vellum ended up completely replacing papyrus so that it, nobody uses papyrus anymore. They started using the, the parchments that were made in Pergamum. So they were forced into that and made a whole new industry out of it. So they had a great library there that they were very proud of with 200,000 scrolls. They defend, They were defenders of the Greek way of life. This is some of the, uh, the boasts that they would make in Pergamum. They had a temple to Athena and to Dionet, uh, Dionysius that was there, the god of wine and drunkenness and all of that. And uh, they also had a temple to Zeus, uh, a great temple that was one of the wonders of the world at that time that you would see when you approach the city. You'd see this great uh, here is in the, this is from the Berlin Museum, and they have a reconstruction of that temple to Zeus that was at Pergamum. And it had the whole history of all of the giants and the gods and all that went around the outside, all of those sculptures. They have those there at the Berlin Museum. And uh, this shows what a massive thing it must have been there on the side of that hill. Some people think when he says that the throne of Satan is there, maybe he was talking about that big throne up there on the side of the hill. I think uh, probably more it's related to the Caesar worship that went on there, but you know, that's at least a thought about what was happening there. They also had a great center or temple for uh, Asclepius, uh, which is the Greek god of healing. So they had a big, light, a big hospital uh, that was there that people would come to to be healed. Uh, he's called the Savior, was the, and that would be very offensive to Christians. That this Asclepius <laughs> is called uh, the Savior, you know, and he is the uh, one that you need to turn to. So, again, his symbol is a snake, which is the symbol that we think of of the temptation that Satan worked through the serpent back there in the beginning. So, that 
makes you think about Satan dwelling there too, that some have suggested that. But again, uh, they had in the place was the center of Caesar worship. And that was the cause of the persecution of the church at that time. Um, you had Domitian that was ruling as the Caesar in Rome, and he had people to address him as Lord uh, and God was what Domitian demanded of the people. He tried to take this deification of the Caesar, you know, very literally, and expected people to address him in that way. And as a sign of loyalty to the to the Roman Empire and to the Caesar, they wanted you to burn on the altar to the emperor a pinch of uh, incense once a year. And, of course, the headquarters of that for all of Asia was there in Pergamum. So when it says it's where Satan's throne was, that's where people would be taken from uh, uh, throughout the, the district to have to uh, stand before that altar and either say Jesus is Lord and God or to say Caesar is Lord. And a Christian could not say Caesar is Lord and God. And for that reason, some were put to death. Some lost their, their lives. So they were under a lot of pressure there. And this uh, worship of Caesar was an act of political loyalty. But the power of Christ is greater than Caesar's. And that's one thing the book of Revelation is written for, is to show us we need to choose to stand with him, be loyal to him. And in the end, we'll have victory through Christ. The letter begins with Christ's self-designation that's taken from that vision that's seen in, in Revelation chapter 1 when Jesus appeared to John. He had hair that was white and, and uh, glowing, and uh, uh, he had a sword that came out of his mouth instead of a tongue. And that's what is seen here. It says, in, To the angel of the church at Pergamum write, The one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, so when you think about a sharp two-edged sword coming out of your mouth, certainly it represents Christ's words, his power of his words, uh, his readiness to judge. A sword was given to a, a, a governor or a Caesar to represent his power over life and death to execute the law. And we know that the government does not... Uh, Bear the sword in vain, we're told in Romans chapter 13, and verse 4. So there, there is a power to judge that is represented by this sword. And it's a great sword that comes out of his mouth like you'd use for capital punishment. Uh, the word of God is addressed uh, in when we look at our armor, the one piece of offensive armor that we have to take the gospel to the world. And to strike a blow for the cause of God is his word. By preaching the gospel, that is a spiritual weapon that the Holy Spirit has fashioned for us. Well, Jesus has a sword, he's pictured here, coming out of his mouth. And he's ready to strike down all those that are lying, that do evil, that are offering temptation to the church, to Satan, and to all of these Nicolaitans, these false teachers that are there in the church at Pergamum that I'm the one with the sword, this two-edged sword that is there to help and to destroy. And so it has the power to penetrate. You think about a sword. It penetrates self-deception. It pricks the heart, brings you to a godly sorrow and a desire to turn away from sin. It is what convicts us. We're told in the book of Hebrews that... Uh, the word of God, the word of Christ is a judge that exposes our inner uh, secrets. It lays bare our conscience and our thoughts and what we really think about and what we're motivated by. It, it lays all of that bare. And uh, you know, we don't know what is in another man's heart. Only the spirit within him knows. But that's not completely true. <laughs> God knows. Christ knows. He's got the sword that can look into your heart and knows what your motives are. And he has the power of life and death to punish if those thoughts and motives and practices aren't right. So you're given a picture. Do you, do you bow down to Caesar and say Caesar is, Caesar is God? <laughs> Caesar is Lord? Or do you respect the one, Jesus Christ, 
who has this sword coming out of his mouth to bring true judgment on anybody. It's a much more powerful sword than Caesar holds. And that seems to be the point of the picture, that we should stand with Christ. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So Jesus writes to the church, and he tells them, I know about your circumstances. I know what it is uh, like there in Pergamum. Jesus Christ knows what it is here in Mustang. He knows about our lives. He knows everything about us. And we should rest assured that that's true. He knows about whatever struggles or trials that we have. So he tells the church at Pergamum, I know about where you dwell. I know that, that uh, you have your residence there in that city and that Satan rules that city. It is where the throne of Satan is located. It's where he dwells. This is one of those good verses to look at to understand the meaning of the word dwell. It's not only just to abide somewhere, but oftentimes it has this idea of ruling. You know, it, who's ruling? Who's abiding in you? Is it the Holy Spirit's words that abide in you and his influence? Or is it uh, something else that rules your heart? Right? It should be that we're under the rule of Christ and through the words of the Holy Spirit that's dwelling in us, that we follow their influence. Here in this city, Satan had a throne. Satan was in charge of all of that false worship that was going on there. And notice he doesn't tell them to run away. You know, I'm writing to you saying, get out of there. Right? That's not what it says. I know you're dwelling there. And he's encouraging them to keep, keep preaching, keep fighting, keep... Uh, Spreading the gospel, what good could they do to save these people that are under Satan's control if they just leave town? So he doesn't say to leave. He encourages them to keep holding on, keep doing what they've been doing, holding on to his name and holding on to his faith. That's what they need to do there. And they've been acting very commendably in that city. He says, you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith. So I appreciate the Lord tells the church that you're standing up for my name, the name of Christ. We wear the name of Christ as Christians. In the name of Christ, we glorify God. We are Christ fellows. We belong to Christ is the meaning of Christian. We're Christ people. And we are having, wearing a name that was given to us by God as disciples. Back in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, at Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. And Peter says that you don't want to suffer as a murderer or as an evildoer or a busybody. But if you suffer for the name of Christ, glorify God in that name. That's the name to wear is the name of Christ. And they weren't ashamed of what that name represented. Your name, Christ's name, is everything Christ is, is what it represents. And they stood up for the fact he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Lord that rules in heaven. They would deny his name. They stood up that Jesus is Lord. And even if they were threatened with death, they were ready to say Jesus is Lord. There's one Lord, and that's Jesus Christ uh, in a spiritual sense that rules over us. So all the names stood for, they were ready to stand up for there. And don't we want the Lord to say that about us? He wrote to the church here, say, I know you stand for my name. You wear my name and you stand up for all that it represents. That's a church that is commendable. They hold fast uh, to the faith, too. They have not denied my faith. There's one faith, and it's Jesus' faith, the one that comes from him. It's one body of doctrine that we're all to practice in the church. And there in uh, Pergamum, that church followed Jesus' faith. Which faith do you follow? Uh, do you follow your faith or this faith or that faith or Jesus' faith? That's the one we're supposed to follow. It's the faith in the book of Jude. It's the one faith, Paul said. So we look at what did Jesus teach on any particular subject and we say that's what we believe. We don't go to a group of men somewhere to dream up a doctrine for us. 
what does the Bible say? What That's our faith. We, we believe that. And that's what they were doing there. And we're told you must continue in that if you want to be saved. And they were holding to the faith. That's a good thing. They were willing to stand up for Christ's name and for the one faith, even in the days of Antipas. Antipas evidently was an evangelist, a preacher there that stood up for the faith and was put to death because he stood up for the name of Christ and the gospel. He uh, bore witness. The word for witness is the same word for martyr. He was, he testified to Christ by giving up his life. He, he, he sealed his testimony with his blood there. Antipas was a man, uh, you know, we don't know the details about his life. Won't it be wonderful to go to heaven and meet Antipas and know what all he went through? Someday that'll be possible for us if we'll be faithful like he was and be willing to die for the Lord. He called Antipas my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Well, there have been some that have died there. There probably were a lot since Antipas that maybe had given their lives. They were going to be more in the future. They may have to give up their life for saying, Jesus is Lord. I'm holding to his faith. But he gained a great reward. Wouldn't it be something to have the commendation of the Lord to say, that's my faithful one, Antipas. That's why I wish, I want him to say that about me someday. Don't you want him to say that about you? My faithful one. He's willing, he was willing to stay loyal to me all the way to the end. And testified there. So there had been those there demonstrated their faith where Satan dwelt. But he has a condemnation for some. You know, the Lord loves us and he tells us the way it is. And he says, you got, you've done some great things up to now in standing up for the faith. But I've got something against you. <clears throat> but I have a few things against you because you have there are some who hold the teaching of Balaam who keep teaching who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality thus also thus you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans so this teaching of Balaam and another similar group, the Nicolaitans, were teaching false doctrine there in the church. But I got this against you. you you're tolerating error being taught among you. The error of compromise with the things of the world and the religions of the world. It wasn't the majority, but there were some that were there. And they needed to be dealt with. Doesn't it sound like there is a lack of church discipline that has gone on there? That there's been some action needs to be taken, and they hadn't taken it. Just like the church at Corinth, they had a man guilty of incest, and they hadn't put him out. Right? They hadn't withdrawn from him. And, the, and Paul points out the sin of the church at Corinth. You cannot tolerate evil. If you allow it among you, it's like leaven. It'll leaven the whole lump if you tolerate false teaching. So it has to be uh, changed or they have to be shipped out. And that's what was going on there. They had some that were following the way of Balaam. Balaam was a prophet in the Old Testament that was hired to come and curse Israel by the king of Moab. And he, he was hurrying to go get his money and God told him, you can't teach anything or say anything but what I tell you to say. So every time he would try to curse Israel, God would make him bless Israel. So that didn't work. He tried it three times. He was pretty determined to get his money. So what did he do after that? To get money, he told Balak, the king of Moab, what you need to do is seduce the Israelites into worshiping idols. That'll get them in, that'll bring a curse on them. And so they used their women to seduce the Israelite men into pagan worship through fornication. And many people, there were many men that went along with that. And uh, there were many that ended up being punished and died because of what Balaam taught this. You, you got to get them to compromise their religion. That's what you do. 
who says you have in the church some that are teaching you look we can we can go to the idols temples we don't have to really mean it you know we can worship or we can go to the feast if our union has a feast to a false god or whatever we can go eat the meat and the sacrifice there and you know just because we do it outwardly doesn't mean we it affects you inwardly right you, you can you can fellowship these people outwardly that's compromising you cannot do that you can't go to the temple of an idol and have the lord's supper the god won't permit it but they were teaching compromise get along with these people here where satan dwells <laughs> It was a baited trap. It says he put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. And that's what they're doing. Just compromise a little here and there. There's no reason for us to have to die for our faith. Let's compromise a little and get along with people. No, you've got to hold to Christ's name and Christ's faith and not fellowship in any error. God doesn't permit us to do that. So they needed to stand up against these false teachers which were there. The, the teaching of Balaam and the teaching of the Nicolaitans, evidently it appears there that there are different groups, but they seem to have the same spirit of compromise that's being taught. In the letter to the church at Ephesus, we studied that the people in Ephesus hated the works, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And uh, the uh, uh, Lord does too. So they, they're thought to have been some Gnostic teachers that thought, <laughs> As long as you keep your mind, you know, pure, doesn't matter what your body does. And, uh, you know, what you do with your body doesn't matter. Uh, there was some of that early teaching that was going on with the Nicolaitans. They were giving people excuses to get involved in the immorality that was there in the city, to get involved in the pagan worship that, uh, you know, were without law. They, they were some that were abusing their liberty, like we were talking about in the earlier sermon. You have freedom in Christ, and they took it to an illegitimate place where you could uh, satisfy the things of the flesh. They say your body doesn't matter, is what some were teaching at first, in, in 1 Corinthians, that uh, you know, uh, food is for the body and the, and the stomach and, and uh, fornication. You know, is uh, a natural thing to satisfy yourself with uh, immorality. Uh, but pointed out, though, no, we belong to the Lord. We've been bought with the price. Our body belongs to the Lord. The Lord has plans for our body. It's not for fornication. It's not for sin, our body. We need to flee these this idolatry and flee immorality. So because you're tolerating these people, and there needs to be some action taken. So it says and gives them a warning. And he gives the same warning. If we have ears, we're supposed to hear this letter. He gives the church at Mustang a warning. Don't tolerate false teaching. Don't tolerate compromising with immorality and idolatry. You can't, uh, you can't compromise with those things. Repent, therefore, or else. Isn't that pretty? Or else. He's got a sword, right? And that sword... It doesn't just make war with people outside the church that persecute the church. This sword also judges and condemns those in the church if they don't do what they're supposed to do. The sword of his mouth. So he says, repent. You need to change your minds. And start going in the right direction and deal with these false teachers. Repent, therefore, or else I am coming to you quickly. And I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. We have an or else. Not a take it, take it or leave it. We need to do in the church what the Lord tells us to do. Or the Lord will bring this sort of judgment. And the guilty are going to be punished. Whether it's just those that are spreading this false teaching. Or it's the church that tolerates the false teaching. Is going to be judged. Well, the doctrine of Christ isn't just some philosophy or fleshly religion, but it is the way of God, and it's the way the Lord demands that we act. And we've got to repent and reform, or uh, we'll be with the Lord will withdraw from us. So He destroyed with righteous judgment. I don't know of anybody that we hear about the Nicolaitans. Are they around? I guess the sword. 
of Christ got rid of them, didn't they? Because we don't hear about Nicolaitans anymore. I'm hopeful that the church there at Pergamum did what they were supposed to do. And they uh, remained faithful. He gives an exhortation and a promise to them. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, everybody needs to give heed to what this letter says. Stand for the name of Christ. Stand for the faith. Don't compromise with error and immorality. To him who overcomes, you fight this good fight. You stay faithful to the Lord like Antipas did. To him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. So if you'll fight this good fight for the Lord, you'll stay faithful and overcome Satan and all of his errors and compromises that he's offering up, the Lord will take care of you. He'll give you the hidden manna. The manna in the Old Testament was that bread from heaven that was given in the wilderness to supply the Israelites with food when they were journeying in the wilderness for 40 years. It appeared with the dew in the morning for six days of the week, but it never came on Sabbath day. So we know it was a divine bread that was given to them. They took some of that manna and put it in a, in a pot and laid it beside or within the Ark of the Covenant so that they would have a, a remembrance of that bread that God fed them with in the wilderness. In the days of the Babylonian captivity, the ark was taken away. It was destroyed, and we don't remember that ark anymore. Along with that bowl of manna was gone. So we think about that hidden manna, though, that source of life. Spiritually speaking, Jesus says, if you'll fight the good fight, I'll give you the hidden manna that bread of life, that spiritual food for your soul. Jesus is the true bread that came down out of heaven. We'll have all of the benefits that Christ has to offer us for our soul if we'll overcome. We'll keep fighting the good fight and not compromise. And we'll have a heavenly feast that will satisfy all of our wants, might be what that figure points to. You'll be given that bread of life forevermore. A wonderful promise of encouragement to them that they'll be supplied with what they need if they'll fight the good fight. They'll also be given a white stone. A white stone was given to people when you were acquitted at court. If the jury was voting guilty, <laughs> you got a black stone and you were found guilty. If the judge gave you a white stone, you were acquitted. You were set free. That could be the meaning of the figure there. Freedom. When you were a slave, if you were set free, you were given a white stone. If you were a person that won a race, sometimes the reward would be a white stone. If you won victory in battle and came back from war as a victorious soldier, they would give you a white stone. So all of those things may lie behind what the Lord's saying. He's going to reward us uh, for for our battle that we fought. The Lord's not going to forget the things that we go through, and he's going to reward us. And upon that stone, uh, that stone of, of reward, is going to be written a new name that's given to you that nobody knows but you. You know, a, a lot of times in the Bible, people get new names, don't they? Abram was given the name Abraham. Sarai was named Sarah, given a new name. And these names represented new status that they had, new things that they were going to be. Father of many nations is what Abraham's name was. Instead of father, he's going to be a father of many nations. Peter, he was called Simon, right? But then he was given the name Peter. He's going to be a rock. Going to have a new status. Well, we're all going to be given a new status if we fight the good fight of faith. The Lord's going to give us that white stone. He's going to give us a new name. How could you know what my name is going to be? Uh, what is it that I've overcome? The only person that knows what I'm fighting against every day and having to overcome in my life is me, right? I'm going to have a new status that shows what I've overcome. And it will be given to me on that last day. It will be given to you. All of you, hang in there. Fight this good fight. 
and you'll be given this new glorious position with the Lord, new uh, reputation that'll be given to you when you reach heaven. It would be a wonderful day. So the Lord gives them encouragement. You keep standing up for the faith. Don't compromise. Brethren, let's have ears and take it to heart and be that kind of church here. We stand for the name of Christ. We stand for Christ's faith, the one he delivered once and for all. And we're not going to add to it or take away from it. And let's not compromise with error. Let's keep walking in the light the way the Lord tells us to do. There's great reward ahead. If you're here this morning and you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, if you've not entered into this saved relationship of the church, we want to encourage you to obey the gospel today. He that has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, is what Jesus said the apostles were to teach. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you been baptized into Christ and entered into this great salvation? We want to encourage you to do that. Won't you let the Lord have his way with you today? Give in to his will and be obedient, and the Lord will raise you up to newness of life. If you need the prayers of the church, if you have any need, let us know. Together we stand and sing.